All right. Um, so the most important ones, of course, are try drink the whole thing. <laughs> but um, let's see if this works. Um, oh, wow, it actually works. So yeah, um, the title for this is Advancing Cyber. Um, I actually have grown quite fond of the word cyber lately. Um, and this is um, verbal shitposting or thought leadership on behalf of Lizard HQ. Um, because all thought leadership is basically just verbal shitposting. So who am I and what is Lizard HQ? So I'm Darren. Um, I do stuff with the internet, um, security stuff. Um, and Lizard HQ is a bunch of people who do security stuff with the cybers. Um, it started off um, as a group of us who'd previously done um, what could be described as bad cybers. And after we all got reformed and stuff, we decided to try to do good things and try to make the internet a little bit of a safer place and a little bit less shitty and stuff um, through research, a bit of activism, some advocacy, advocacy etc., etc. Um, so it's kind of a loose-knit collective of people from, who kind of share a common background, um, and we just kind of work together in some interesting projects and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, um, that kind of sums up the who we are and who I am. And so as for what I'm actually going to be talking about is trying to advance the, the state of what we do. So we all do security stuff. Um, because this is a security conference. Um, so we're going to start off with a couple of really simple facts of life um, about the current state of the security industry um, and the current state of how information security is. And these are opinions um, that I personally believe are facts. You can feel free to disagree with it and call it a load of bollocks if you want. But the first one is, InfoSec as an industry, we suffer this kind of collective amnesia. Um, we keep forgetting things. We learn lessons and then promptly forget them. Um, like every couple of years, we solve SQL injection, and then databases start getting dropped, dumped left, right, and center. Um, and it's about a five-year institutional memory. You can look at um, an interesting example is you look at some of the content at Black Hat and DEF CON, right? And you could, in theory, it'd be a bit unethical, but you could go and take some research from five years ago, repackage it slightly, present it again, and it'd be the new shiny. We keep seeing the same patterns, the same cyclical patterns, with very little in the term in terms of advancement. And it's literally like we can't remember shit. You know, we just we have a short-term buffer of what's shiny, what's new, what's terrifying, what's the latest branded heartbleed, shell shock, whatever the fuck it is. Um, and then we forget about it because there's another big shiny thing. There's another branded bug or whatever it is, or there's another oh cloud scary or Internet of Things scary or you know kids using toasters to DDoS Minecraft scary. Um, and this is a serious problem because we keep forgetting the lessons we've learned and we keep forgetting what it is that we learn and we just don't advance forward very quickly. And unless we start actually remembering stuff and taking lessons on board, um, we're not going to get anywhere. For example, like take for example passwords for fuck's sake, guys. We've been saying passwords are dead for as long as I've been in this industry. In fact, longer. Oh, passwords are bad. Oh, password policies, passwords this or... Another one is like storage of credentials, like, oh, don't use MD5 or don't store it in plain text. And what do you see? You see plain text fucking everywhere. You see MD5, you see people thinking Base64 is encryption. It's 2018, you know, we shouldn't be having these discussions anymore, but we are. And that's depressing because not only do we forget shit within our own industry, but we're really crap at sharing stuff with others. And what's worse is we also largely ignore academic research. And this is a big one. Um, like, as an industry, like you'll see loads of cool stuff coming out of various security research firms or pen testing shops when their people have a little bit of time to do some research work. They'll come up with something really cool, but they completely ignore a lot of the prior art that's in academia. Because when you look at the academic prior art, you go, oh, that's impractical, or it's got a long, lengthy academic paper that nobody can be bothered reading. Um, it's like we're afraid of books. You know, we're afraid of actually reading shit, but there's loads of amazing stuff in published academic literature that we just ignore. And I think we'd be a lot better off as an industry and as, you know, people trying to get shit done and as hackers if we actually paid attention to that stuff. Um, and going further, we're also crap at learning from other industries. Um, it's only in the last couple of years that I've really seen people kind of do outreach, like security people talk at, say, developer conferences more and more, or have developers, you know, talk to security people and actually interact and engage with each other. But we don't seem to pick up the lessons. Like, what we do is effectively quality assurance. We're QA engineers, not hackers, when in the pen testing industry. We're just an outsourced QA shop, and we don't learn lessons from other QA shops. Like, we don't really have any standards, yet everyone else who is QA has standards. Um, 
we keep making up really kind of okay ones that nobody ever implements. Um, and we just don't seem to learn. We don't have like best practices and stuff that other industries have. Um, and this is something that we need to take on board and we need to, you know, actually start learning. So I'm going to tell you about some of the cool stuff. Um, some, some of it's cool, some of it's less cool, but, um, some of it's interesting technical directions that you'll find in academia or you'll find in, um, some slightly abstract things where, you know, you go, oh, how is that practical? And turns out really practical. Connector. There we go. Um, and then in the latter half, I'm going to talk about some industry wide issues that we really need to unfuck because otherwise we're screwed. Um, so we'll take, for example, you want to find some neat bugs, right? You're a hacker, you want to find some bugs, you know, you want to find some neat O-days, you want to get a nice website with some branding up um, that says something like, you know, heart shock, you know, latest something or other in SSL TLS, um, and you want to be, you know, you want to find bugs. Or maybe you want to sell O-days to the government or whatever it is that you do. So you need to find some bugs. Now, average fuzzing is basically millions of monkeys of typewriters hammering in inputs in the hope that something crashes, and the hope that, you know, it's generally we tend to, like, average fuzzers are just kind of chuck stuff at it until it breaks, until it falls over, until it fucks up, and it's not very efficient. It's not very effective. It does work, but the days of, like, dumb fuzzers are limited and numbered, um, which is why we've got newer stuff, like the state of the art in fuzzing is AFL. Um, and that's an actual American fuzzy lop, the rabbit that the fuzzer's named after. And that does some really interesting things where it does like code path tracing and stuff and tries to find new directions in the software, you know, new code paths for um, execution to go through to get greater coverage of the thing you're fuzzing. Um, Gray mentioned earlier, um, you mentioned that it couldn't be used on binaries, but that's actually been fixed. Um, there's another Queemu mode, just to update everyone that there's a, you can now virtualize a binary, even Windows ones, which is awesome, um, and you can fuzz those, but it kind of barely works and slow as fuck. But that's kind of the state of the art, is this thing that works in a bunch of stuff finds amazing bugs if you can get it to work, um, and that's the state of the art in fuzzing. Um, this is the, I think that's my screen connector that's... Um, there we go. So yeah, the, the state of the art. So. The state of the art hasn't actually gotten all that far because we've had runtime tracing and fuzzing done before. Um, so here's some stuff that we keep not using. Um, I've seen it a couple of times being used, but it's big in academia land and stuff. Like I've seen loads of papers and this stuff, but nobody really cared. Like take, for example, grammar-based fuzzing or stateful fuzzy things that actually give a shit about the state of the program and about the state of the protocol or symbolic execution, which people might have heard of, but they'll probably never have used. You'll see tons of academic research on it, and turns out it's a really practical technique for getting stuff done fast and for time saving, but people just kind of look at it and go, oh, don't know how that works. No, that doesn't look practical. That's, you know, it only worked on some contrived example somewhere, or, oh, that was just for the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge or whatever, you know, it's totally not usable, even though it is. Um, and these are things that we should use. We should take these from academia, and we should take these from there, and we should go, actually, this is awesome. Let's do stuff with this, because these will help you find bugs, exploit bugs, and generally be better at what you're doing. So firstly, grammar is important. If you're dealing with software, um, understanding grammar is a really important thing. It's also super important on the internet. Um, so why is grammar important? Fuzzing is basically fucking about with an input language. When you fuzz a program, you're talking to the program and you're trying to make it crap itself and die or crash or whatever. But what you're sending to it, be it files, network packets or whatever, you're sending it language. You're talking to it in an input language. Languages have grammar. Um, like they have rules on how the language is constructed. They have rules on how the syntax is. You know, this bit goes before this bit. This bit can be so long, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, defining like the character set and stuff, defining how to construct a sentence in that language. If you can define the grammar of a language, like if you can define, okay, this is the rules that make up this language, you can then efficiently emit and mutate valid inputs or invalid ones. You can emit stuff that's in the input language of the program you're testing. So take, for example, a file parser that parses PDF files. 
If you want to fuzz that, you want to maybe make something that understands how a PDF file is structured and what's in a PDF file and the language of the portable document format. And then you can emit PDFs that do all sorts of batshit crazy things that'll probably cause the interpreter or the parser, which interprets and parses that language to, you know, do horrible things like override EIP with 4141414141. Um, you know, that means you can get stuff done. There's an amazing piece of work by the Mozilla security team. Um, there's a grammar-based fuzzer they wrote called Dharma, um, after the, the crowd to do with the island in Lost or whatever. Um, and it emits valid JS for all sorts of weird shit that allows you to more efficiently fuzz features in browsers. And they've that as part of their whole fuzzing toolkit for checking for bugs in Firefox. There's another grammar-based fuzzer called Radamsa that's worth looking at, and that'll emit outputs sometimes that are valid-ish, and it'll allow you to more efficiently find bugs because you can more efficiently explore the state of the program by feeding it actual stuff that it's going to, you know, go down the tree in Paris and do stuff with, as opposed to a big, huge string of A's. The days are just going Perl-E print A times 9001 pipe to program or pipe to netcat are kind of dead. You're not going to find any good bugs that way anymore. If you do, the person who wrote it should be dragged out and shot. But um, if you do fuzzing like this, where you actually use the grammar and start defining it and understanding it, you'll find way higher quality bugs, you'll find interesting logic issues, you'll find cool shit, and it's easy. There's nothing hard and challenging about it, it's just that people ignore it because it's seen as, oh, academia, and a lot of the stuff is just written in papers, there isn't very many blog posts on it, and InfoSec seems to, commute to consume shit as blog posts or talks as opposed to, you know, research papers. Um, so what does this lead to? Well, yep. Smarter fuzzing, better code coverage, um, better overall results. You find deeper bugs that are, you know, five or six layers of parsing deep, you know, deep within the bowels of some function that nobody's touched in 10 years that your normal fuzzer would never reach. You will find bugs there that other people miss, which gives you a competitive advantage. So if you're in the game of finding bugs to sell, um, like selling to, say, a VRP like Zero or a shady company like Zerodium or whatever the fuck, or if you're selling like HP Zero Day Initiative or SSD or whatever, you can have a competitive advantage by finding higher quality bugs that nobody else will find, so you'll reduce the chance of bug collisions with other researchers, and you'll get more payouts, more cash money. There's ethical concerns there, of course, with selling bugs, but that's up to you to figure out. Um, now, the next bit is smashing the state. Um, so... This is where it gets, this is where we can follow on from the grammar part when it comes to pro, when it comes to analyzing programs and stuff that we see a lot in academia, but we don't see in practice. Um, by examining like state, like seeing it as a state machine. So you're feeding it an input language. It does something to the input language. It parses, interprets it, but it also will in a lot of times hold state. So state matters. So if you're fuzzing a protocol, like we'll take, for example, FTP. You have to connect to the thing, and then you have to log in, you have to do stuff, it sends stuff back, you send stuff forward. You know, there's a whole protocol there, and it's, just, you know, there is state, you know, from when you connect, you log in, whatever. Or, you know, how stuff is sent over back in weird binary garbage protocols, where you have like a hello, how are you packet, and then things like, oh, what's up, buddy, how's it going? Here's, you know, an authentication challenge. Oh, okay, yep, here's, you know, the response. If you, if your fuzzer or your testing tools don't understand the state of a program, they're not going to get very far. They'll bail out at the initial bits. You'll get code coverage in fuzz testing of only just the initial packets as opposed to the deeper bugs. So you can't just blindly spam stuff. You've got to follow the protocol, the thing. You've got to maybe re-implement the protocol, maybe patch the um, original client, or maybe do interception and fucking about with it, whatever. Or rewrite the protocol from scratch. You know, write your own implementation, write your own library. Um, now, the thing about stateful fuzzing is that this people who do web app testing get this. People who do web app audits, they get stateful fuzzing. Um, they just it makes sense to them because, you know, you've got state like, are you logged in? Are you logged out? You know, did you do this then this or this then this that you need to you know keep in mind when you're testing an app? Like, is it authenticated or unauthenticated? You know. Or, and that stuff, and you have to keep like the session state and stuff like that. If you're not doing that when testing other stuff, you're missing out. You know, you're going to miss a ton of really fun bugs. We suck at this in general for other stuff. Like a lot of fuzzers for protocols that I've seen will only effectively fuzz the initial hello packets. They won't actually implement like a back and forth and send the mutated input as like the fifth thing down the line. Because by then the program will have gone, no, no, invalid. 
and bail without crashing. And if we combine this to our previous grammar work, if we start fuzzing stuff with where we're actually testing the input language of the program and we're also testing the state of it, we'll be able to do far better work. We'll be able to create, we'll be able to find more security holes. We'll be able to make software more secure and everything will be lovely. And then we might be able to, you know, quit and go herd sheep or whatever. Um, so yeah, this is kind of the, how you'd go about it. You treat the target as a state machine that accepts an input language, does something to the input language, and maybe shits something back out. You model, you know, you have to model the language of its inputs, i.e. define a grammar. You have to model its state, so you have to go, okay, I have to send this, then this, and now you can fuzz, and this is where you find the best stuff. This is where the gold mine happens. This is where you find the completely bizarre, wacky bugs um, that nobody else is going to find, because nobody else is looking. Except for people in academia who seem to love playing about with this shit, except only with toy implementations and stuff. Um, another thing from ac that academia does a lot with is symbolic execution. I virtually never see people in the infosex space actually do anything with this, and it's largely relegated to academia. It's largely seen as an academic toy. It's largely seen as, oh, we'll, you know, use SimX on these toy programs to, you know, prove it works and, like, it can be used for like formal verification, formal specification. There's some people in hardware land, like the RISC-V people do a bunch of SIMX stuff to kind of, um, or they use solvers to solve, um, these theorem solving to prove if something is to the spec. If you start getting a grips with this stuff, it's amazing. It's absurdly useful. Now, I'm not qualified to give you an actual crash course in SIMX. I know a guy who is. He's way smarter than me, um, cause he actually studies it for ages and ages. But the too long don't read is you reduce problems to, you reduce problems to symbolic, like an equation to solve, you reduce them to math. And then you do math. And then it sometimes gives you a really bizarre solution if a solution is found. There's stuff like Z3 and Manticore that make this really easy. They have Python APIs that allow you to do stuff. Um, you basically just reduce your problem. You know, you define your problem and you go, okay, here's the problem. Here is desired state I want to reach or whatever. Find me a way to find this state. And you can just fire it off to, you know, you can just let the CPU do all the work for you. You just let compute time as opposed to analysis time happen. And it's really good for stuff like crack me's, um, like, or reversing challenges or stuff like that. Like take, for example, the crack me that the, I can't remember the name of them, but there's a crack me challenge at the, some of the guys that there, they're giving away pie, Raspberry Pi, um, as the, Prizes, but um, if you were to apply, maybe you could apply symbolic execution. That you know, you could literally def go get the thing, Manticore, do some wrappery stuff, and then go, okay, find me a solution that gets to the bit where it prints the flag, and ignore everything else, and it'll explore the state of the program and vomit out, you know, oh, we found a solution that puts in to get the flag, and you can do stuff like this where it takes you like maybe an hour's work, you know, a bit of reversing a bit of writing a quick script, and then you just run it, bugger off, go to the pub, come back, and you've got a result. So, saves analyst time. Saves you from having to sit there and either going, next, 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 cross-references, next. You know, it just makes life easier. Or sitting in a debugger all day going, oh my god. <laughs> you know, we should use these things, but instead it's just left to, again, academia land. So we need to up our game. We need to take these things. Um, these tools are out there. These stuff, these solutions, like that I've just mentioned, they're out there. There's loads of work done in it. It's just that we've been collectively ignoring it. We've been collectively going, nah, fuck that. That's all our, you know, academic nonsense. Nobody cares. Um, no, it's, there's cool stuff there. Actually skim through some papers, read some stuff. You'll find amazing stuff. Um, another thing from academia that I stumbled across a while back was program synthesis. Now this blew my mind. Um, and this is something that people should look at if you're interested in reversing. Um, so imagine you have a set of inputs to a, a function in a binary and you've set of corresponding outputs and you've got this horribly obfuscated binary function that you can't really be arsed sitting there all day, you know, demangling and obfuscating and stuff. And, but you need to know what that function does. Um, you could sit down in Ida and lose hours of your life and not sleep for a couple of days and get all twitchy. Or you could just not do that because that sounds like hard work. Um, there's some really cool stuff using magic and science where it does the hard work for you by using maths. Where you go, okay, here are the inputs, here's outputs, here is 
blah function. And then you can use program synths to go, okay, synthesize me a function that does whatever the fuck this thing does, and it'll do cool math stuff like Monte Carlo tree search and fitness testing and all this amazing stuff where it'll eventually figure out what the hell was going on there. Um, people have used this to unpack like horrible packers like Thymidia and VM Protect and stuff. They've, where the packer like build, has a VM built in that does stuff that makes it really hard to unpack. They've used this to do automated unpacking, which was amazing, completely blew my mind. Um, yeah, there's stuff there. Um, I'm gonna switch back to grammar for a minute. Um, Again, inputs are languages, and another important one that was made glaringly clear to me a while back after a chat with somebody, um, and this is something that not a lot of people think about, it seems, is that if inputs are languages, are they Turing or sub-Turing complete? Like, is your input language also a programming language? Can, we, can they be used to perform arbitrary computation on in the context of the program that's accepting the input? Um, and the people at langsec.org who are way smarter than me have written some really amazing stuff about this. Um, you should check them out. They've written some amazing stuff. They've, you know, whole theories of stuff and they've definitions of things. Um, well worth a look. Well worth looking into. Um, and they're like, okay, how about we stop creating Turing input, com Turing complete input languages? Because you'll find them all over the place where accidentally, instead of creating an input, you know, an input where it's just, your name or some values or whatever, you've just given somebody a virtual machine with its own programming language to fuck with, which means they can compute on inside your program and do horrible things. And if we approach writing code this way, we can avoid common pitfalls. Like, if we avoid giving people literally a VM to play in when we write an input form or whatever the fuck it is, um, we can avoid getting wrecked. And if we have overly complex protocols and input languages, you can virtually guarantee there's going to be some level of Turing completeness there, and you're going to get wrecked. So simple is good. And it's like, stop giving us... So the whole idea is it's when you have a Turing complete input language, it's a weird machine. It's a weird machine with no documentation. We have to find out a program for it. So there's a couple of images here from the Langsec site that crack me up. Stop weird machines um, and no more Turing complete input languages, um, which are very true because, you know, we got to stop, you know, providing people with these opportunities to skullfuck all of our security and just wreck us and steal our databases and rip off our credit cards and ruin our lives. Um, we got to stop doing this. Um, and to switch away from that, cargo cultism is not always terrible. Um, I, I occasionally hear the term cargo cult security. There is one cult of cargo that is amazing for security, and that'd be Rust. And how many here have heard of Rust? Oh. That's way more than normal. Normally it's like three people. Whenever you say Rust, people are like, what the fuck is that? Is that stuff on the bottom of my car? But um, what's Rust? Um, if you're writing stuff in C, just stop. Just stop what you're doing right the fuck now and just switch to writing stuff in Rust. It's better. Um, just as a programming language, it's better. Um, it's better than pretty much everything else because... It's, it can be used for systems programming and low-level shit, unlike managed stuff like Java and .NET where you can't really do any of that nice low-level stuff. But it's memory safe, so you, you're not going to get buffer overflows all over the shop. It avoids you shooting yourself in the face repeatedly by string copying shit all over the place, so it stops you from like royally shafting yourself. It's also type safe, which is amazing, because now you can't mix up types, so you can't have type issues and stuff in your software either. So it generally prevents you fucking up. And if you really want to shoot yourself in the foot, you literally have to prefix stuff with unsafe, which says you accept the risk. And when somebody does code review and they see this unsafe block, they go, I know, I'm sure we don't need that. You know, not sure what you're doing there, buddy. Why is this unsafe? So if you're auditing Rust code, just grep for the word unsafe and you've found all the unsafe bits. Um, what Rust won't do for you, though, I mean, it is generally better and amazing, but it will not stop the business logic flaws. Um, you can still do really, really stupid shit. Um, it will not stop you from doing that. It will not prevent you from having, if you wrote a web app in Rust, like maybe a CGI binary or whatever, it will not stop you from do, like having SQL injection or cross-site scripting or whatever the fuck all over the shop. You can, you know, it won't stop you from writing damn vulnerable web app in Rust, 
but at least you're getting away with, you no longer have type issues or memory safety issues. Um, so it's just a thing that, you know, if we're going to advance, we need to encourage people to actually do stuff in this as opposed to writing really hacky shit in C. Um, we should instead switch to doing stuff safely. And the problem is, pen testers tend to write really awful code in C to do things, or really awful code in other unsafe languages to do shit, because like, oh, it's okay, nobody's going to ever run this in production. And then somebody does. Um, so maybe give, give Rust a go. Um, and that's the Rust evangelism for today done. <laughs> and just while I was on that, a quick note in mitigation. So I had a... Recently, there was a discussion, um, there's this lengthy discussion on Twitter every so often about, are mitigations worthwhile? Like, mitigations can be bypassed. So, you can have stuff like ASLR or whatever, and you hear like, oh, ASLR has been bypassed by whatever, by somebody using absurd ROP chain gubbins. Um, they've bypassed all the things. And it's like, okay, yeah, they can be bypassed, and that might lead you down the road of pessimism, where you're like, give up. But, um... Some mitigation is better than none, um, part of the whole principle of defense in depth. So if you take some of the stuff from earlier and you start applying it, you will make stuff harder to exploit. Or if you switch it around, you'll find easier ways to own stuff. Um, and the next thing that I want to chat about briefly was analytics for pen testers. And this is, you see, this is all things that we should be doing to be better, right? To advance the cybers. And this is something that I was thinking about a while back and I started doing. So, you have a shit ton of reports, right? For, you know, think of all the tests you've ever done or whatever, and you have a pile of reports. What you should actually do, and this is something that I'd encourage everyone to do on an individual or on a company level, is data mine your reports for findings. Log them all somewhere in some kind of management thing where you can figure out what are the most common findings you have. Or if you keep finding the same shit over and over again, you don't have to rewrite the bloody issue a hundred times. After rewriting some bullshit SSL issue about 50 times while doing reporting, I suddenly realized... I've written this same sentence so many times. Why don't I just have a template somewhere? So you can data mine your reports over time, even on a specific client, to determine what they're fixing. Are they fixing stuff? What are the developers doing? Are they sniffing glue or are they actually getting shit done? And you can generate internal statistics that you can even share with your clients. You know, you can then go to your client and go, look, buddy, we've been doing pen tests for you for five years, and here's the shit that you tend to ignore that we wreck you every single time on. Maybe you should, you know, actually close that ticket that you have in your internal bug tracker or not. Um, also, from like for a pen tester or from a pen testing company level, if you start finding the same shit across companies in a vertical, you can see what their response and fix times are, and you can try and make predictions, or tool up to more efficiently own them, or direct your research. And we can go even further beyond analyzing reports, like analytics is something that pen testing people should, or hackers in general should do more of. Like there's loads of cool work done by various people using machine learning to generate password lists based on leaked password lists. Um, Analyzing leaked data may have ethical concerns. For those of you in academia, there's probably an ethics thing you have to do at some point. But realistically, fuck that. It's public data. Who gives a shit? Once it's on pay spin, it's free. Um, just tell your ethics person, no, no, it's public data. It's free. Bugger off. Um, some excellent work's already been done in this field, like Troy Hunt's done his pwn passwords thing. Um, my friend Phoenix does some amazing work on data stuff, which he talked about at B-Size London a while back. Um, and there's other cool research out there about analyzing leaked data to find interesting things, because you can use this to speed up, say, your hash cracking or whatever. Um, data analysis on an internet scale is another interesting one for directing research. Um, I'll just quickly touch on this, but um, bright stuff like Binary Edge, Shodan, Census, ZoomI, etc., 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 all these port scans as a service, basically, um, they're underutilized. Everyone uses them to go find open VNCs of dishwashers or whatever, the, or CCTVs or whatever the fuck. Instead, think about it another way. Flip it in its head. Look for, instead of going, oh, I want to find a weird thing. Instead go, hmm, there's a whole shitload of this. What the hell is this? Maybe I should get one of those and look at it. Then you can direct, you know, if you want findings that are high impact for publicity, you can just go find a thing where there's a load of them and show it and then go find bugs in it. And then you've got, you know, the headline prepackaged. Hackers find bugs in thing with 50 gajillion of them on the internet and the world's going to explode. Um, so you can use this to cheat and direct research a bit. Um, instead of finding bugs then hunting for the things, find weird things and then find bugs in them later. Um, and be careful though, a 
person on a showdown binge, you know, just don't disturb them, just leave them and back away slowly because showdown is highly addictive. Um, there we go. Super dodgy connector. Um, but yeah, the, another thing is there's a lot of people shit on automation a lot in testing work. People, people like, they look down on it. But that's bollocks. We need to embrace more automation. I used to shit in people who used automated tools. I used to do that when I was younger, and then I realized, hang on, they're useful. You get coverage fast, and then you can, while the Scanny McScan thing is running, you can do stuff by hand, and you can increase your throughput of stuff getting done. Um, however, the current automated tools, they're shit, okay? Um, they're absolutely rubbish. Um, like, they're just generally trash, like they, they do some things well and then they're crap at everything else. Or they attempt to do everything and they do nothing well. Um, so we need to either build, we need to, I think we need to build better ones because our vendors won't. Um, like take for example a lot of the web app scanning tools. They're all trash. They'll only find the low hanging fruit. They won't find anything interesting. They're rubbish at navigating sessions. No matter how much the vendor goes, oh our web scanning can do herp derp derp blah blah blah. And then they'll give you a trial copy that you can only test on their hosted vulnerable web app. Which, you know, there's always something a little bit shady about those benchmarks. So we can either build our own ones, or because we're lazy, we can probably just cobble together some monstrosities that work from existing solutions, which is realistically what we're all going to do, because nobody's going to write a real web app scanner anytime soon. As well as automation, a thing that we really need to embrace is collaboration. Um, this is a question for everyone. Um, like, how do you share results? That, say you're working with other testers on an engagement. How do you share your results with them? Say you're... You and three others, maybe not in the same office, are testing a web app. Are you all doing the exact same shit to the web app? Or, you know, are you duplicating effort? Or are you actually sharing stuff? Um, how do you deduplicate effort? Uh, do you even bother? Or is everyone running the same active scan and burp at the same time? Um, or running the same thing or trying the same shit? You know, we need to find ways to collaborate. Um, there's one solution that I've been looking at is Faraday by Infobyte, which is pretty cool, but it's there is a community version that is free, um, that's worth playing with. It, uh, there's a few others, like there's a open source tool called Serpico for like uploading your results as you go and it'll generate reports and stuff. Um, but finding ways to more efficiently collaborate on tests is fucking vital. Otherwise your client gets fuck all value. Um, and that's something we're really good at is delivering bugger all value, um, as an industry. We tend to deliver like, we tend to under deliver and overcharge in a lot of cases. Um, so tying up all that bit, we need to automate and collaborate on stuff and also logging. Um, you need to be able to tell your client what, a, what actually you were doing. And the logging can help you find weird shit later. Like I've missed issues during the initial thing, then reviewing logs later gone, wait, what the hell is that? And found something absolutely bizarre. And another thing is if you've defined a workflow for doing something, you can automate that workflow. Um, as the chat from AWS this morning was saying, if it's a bunch of shit that's the same every time, you can write a script for it. Um, write the script for it. It'll save you typing. It'll save you from repetitive, you know, the risk thing, RSI. Um, and also the aggregation results, like if you have a collaboration platform that allows you to aggregate results and do analysis, um, not only makes... Yeah, it makes reporting easier because you've got all the shit in one place as opposed to in a million different text files in a directory of like, named like lol.txt, lol1.txt, lol2.txt for all the requests that trigger to SQLi or whatever, where, you know, when it comes to reporting day, you're sitting down going, what the fuck was I doing? <laughs> um, now, beyond the technical side, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on non-technical related stuff um, that we need to sort our shit out on. Um, and I'll blow through this pretty quick. Left this to the end, it's a bit important. If you're here for purely technical content, just go to the pub now and start drinking. Um, this will be deemed a waste of time. If you're a manager, maybe go to the pub, because I might say some bad things about managers. Um, but as an industry, we've got some issues. Um, and the first of these is that we need to look outward. Um, we need to look out beyond our little circle jerky infosphere filter bubble of infosec. We need to look out at other people's stuff. And somebody recently asked, how many pen testers can actually develop an application? Like how many web app testers can actually develop a web app? Because you get web app testers, you know, that don't actually know how to develop a web app. They don't know how the web app is built. They can't code a web app, but they're testing them. 
or pen testers who could tr transition enterprise software development. Um, how many testers could actually go and develop software for a living? Or testers who could administer a AD network with thousands of endpoints. Um, anybody? Oh, one. We've got one. <laughs> it's no, we're we're not sysadmins as a rule. Like as a general rule, we're not developers. Um, and yet we spend our whole time shitting on developers and sysadmins. You know, we go test their shit and then we laugh at them. We make fun of them and go, look at these fucking idiots. You know, they misconfigured this obscure thing. They were just trying to get their job done and get everything to work. They don't give a fuck about the tiny details. They give a damn about the whole thing working. You know, about the overall picture. And we need to learn some stuff from them. We need to learn what it is they actually do. You know, we don't understand their job. We need to actually talk to them and go, why is this that way? Um, so the next time you're dealing with clients, IT staff or the developers, ask questions. When you find something, instead of just going, oh, fucking idiots didn't parameterize their queries or whatever, or oh, not using PDO, instead just go and ask. You know, be like, hey guys, is there a reason you made this design decision? Or is there a reason it's configured this way? And you'll learn to help them better, and that'll help you grow as an individual and as a person and be better at your job. Except PHP developers totally find a shit in them. Um, <laughs> They brought it on themselves. Another thing is, we also need to look inward at our own industry. And this is, this is the bit that's a bit grim, right? Because InfoSec has created a second type of exploitation. And that'd be exploiting you um, as a tester. So I've heard lots of stuff of people in the last while about badly paid apprenticeships and grad schemes, where you're basically working your arse off for bugger all money. and that kind of seems unfair if you're working like absurd hours. Um, stuff in people's contracts where it opts you out of the European Working Time Directive, which I find massively unfair. I've seen it in people's hiring contracts, and I'm like, no, you know you cannot back in, right? And they can't make you work all that overtime. But people opt out because they need a job. Um, and people, you know, they go into it going, oh, I'm getting paid to hack. This is going to be fucking wonderful. Followed by, I just did two 60-hour weeks in a row, and I need to die in a corner. Um, super dodgy contracts that have seen about what you do outside of work, like limiting your ability to do research outside of work, because they're like, oh no, you can't do anything that would be of detriment to the company outside of work time, you know, by taking on external work or freelance contracting, or sketchy IP clauses where they own your co- you know, where they own those shitty bash scripts that you wrote in a lunch break. Um, that can fuck off. No, my shitty bash script is mine. You're not putting your logo on it. Also, well, actually you can, because it's shit. <laughs> but, um, and then you've got these endless internships that never actually go anywhere. And we're terrible for this. We keep taking on interns and we go, oh yeah, this will transition to a, you know, into a senior role. But by the time that could possibly have happened, they've burned out. And it's, you know, it's limited upward mobility for a lot of people entering the industry. And we need to fix this. We need to, you know, like grab, you know, go to your boss, be like, dude, this is not fucking cool. You know, I haven't had a bonus in two years. You know, sort your shit out. You know, you need to actually have, you know, we need to, go and, you know, not be as horribly exploited. Another one that pisses me off is ever-increasing util time. A lot of people complain about, oh, I've just spent the last three weeks on site and I only got to see my wife and kids for, like, the weekends. Mate, that's not cool. You should be, you know, doing work to fund your shit, you know, your personal life, not literally living to go to work and to go to Slough and spend your time in a data center or whatever for three weeks. <laughs> I mean, fuck that, right? <laughs> Fuck that noise. If your util time is more, th like, if you're on site more than 50%, just stop turning up. Just stop going. You know, collect, you know, collectively we can change this. If they're like, oh, you need to spend three weeks in Slough in a travel lodge, just be like, no, I'll do a week. You know, one week per month is fine. You need the rest of your time to do family shit or whatever. Or go outside and not be in Slough and, you know, <laughs> just, yeah. Um, yeah, this insane levels of these extended on-site engagements are literally killing people. Like, people are burning out. They're not seeing their families and kids. They're not going home. I was talking to one guy who spends, like, five days a month in his apartment, like, on average, and the rest of it's in, like, some shitty travel lodge. And he was joking to me that he now, no, no matter which travel lodge he goes to, they're all the same. And it really jarred him once when the desk was, like, a couple of inches further away from his bed. He was like, whoa, this is different. I was like... Dude, you literally live in Travel Lodge. You know, the hell with that. It's unhealthy. Um, and this leads to rapid burnout cycles. People burn out fast. Um, 
which, you know, mental health issues, which we tend to totally fucking disregard. It's also Mental Health Awareness Week, apparently. Um, so this was fairly well timed. But, you know, if you're constantly being on site, constantly being hammered with util time and stuff, you're not going to be healthy at the end of it. You're going to end up all sorts of fucked up. And you're not going to be able to, you know, do what you enjoy doing well. So we need to fix this. And if we want to advance anything, we need to fix ourselves first. You know, there's the whole physician heal thyself shit going on that we need to do. So I don't know how we'll fix this, you know, line up our managers and shoot them. Um, you know, seize the means of production or whatever. Um, great revolutions in the workplace. I don't know. Maybe, you know, I've bandied around the idea of maybe we should have a, a union of infosec workers or a professional association or some shit. I don't know. That's for other people, you know, to, to help figure out. Um, we need to actually, you know, document these things and go, this is not cool. We need it to stop because we're producing, we're not being as good as we could be. Um, so the TLDR of all that, for those of you asleep, was we need to start actually using the stuff we have that we just kind of left in academia land. Um, we need to listen to others and stuff. You know, we need to actually listen to our you know, listen to the people we work for and work with. And also we need to fix what's horribly broken in our own industry, which is how it treats its people. And because we don't fix that, we're going to get fucking nowhere. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, you can check out I'll be posting a bunch of this shit on Twitter or the interwebs. I'm currently locked out of all these things because I'm an idiot who left his two-factor phone um, behind before coming to the UK. Um, so I can't get into any of it. Security's fucking wonderful, right? Until it stops working. <laughs> and that'll be the end of that. So, pub. <laughs>